All right, so we're going to read A Sound of Thunder by Ray Bradbury. Woo! Yeah! Woo! Okay. Yay! Okay. The sign on the wall seemed to quaver under a film of sliding warm water. Eccles felt his eyelids blink over his stare, and the sign burned in this momentary darkness. Time Safari, Inc. Safaris to any year in the past. You name the animal. We take you there. You shoot it. <laughs> what? Exactly. Yeah, that's what it says. Um, that's the sign. So this company is called Time Safari, Inc. or Time Safari, Incorporated. I'm not very good at drawing boxes. It is okay. Oh, it's so crooked. Um, great. So we've got a little imagery here at the very beginning describing how this sign looks on the wall and how it kind of um, seems to quaver a little bit um, and this whole film of sliding warm water on it. I mean, that's not actually happening. It's just kind of blurry before his eyes is what we're supposed to think. Um, what do you think about this business? Does this sound, does this sound good? No? Yes? I mean, if you're a hunter, yeah. Now, okay, and I want to remind you, this is a science fiction story. So obviously it's not true. It's going to be a little out there. It's going to have some elements of technology and that kind of thing in it. Um, so this whole any year in the past, this is time travel. Straight up. A warm phlegm gathered in Eccles' throat. He swallowed and pushed it down. The muscles around his mouth formed a smile as he put his hand slowly out upon the air and in that hand waved a check. For ten thousand dollars to the man behind the desk. Now, I think ten thousand dollars is a lot of money. There's a lot of people who think it is not. Um, in 1952, when this story was written, that was a lot of cash. Just to put that out there. Wealthy people. I'm not one. <laughs> Does this safari guarantee I come back alive? Fair question. We guarantee nothing, said the official, except the dinosaurs. He turned. This is Mr. Travis, your safari guide in the past. He'll tell you what and where to shoot. If he says no shooting, no shooting. If you disobey instructions, there's a stiff penalty of another $10,000 plus possible government action on your return. Oh, so it costs $10,000. Cost $10,000 to go on the safari, and the safari is to travel back in time to go hunting for an animal of your choice, which in this case is a... Dinosaur. Dinosaur. This guy named Eccles. Okay, so we've got a safari guide. It's $10,000 to go on safari. Um, they're going to shoot a dinosaur. Now, why is he asking this? It's dangerous, right? I would be a little nervous. And I'm also going to say that I think this is a little bit foreshadowing. If he's asking things like, does this guarantee we come back alive? We guarantee nothing. I'm sorry, but when I'm getting ready to jump out of the plane, and I'm like, are we going to be okay? I can't promise you anything. You're jumping on three. One, two, three. No. Yes. Okay. Now, if you disobey instructions, there's a stiff penalty. Another ten thousand dollars. Why is it? Why is the government going to get involved? It's time travel. Well, what's the big deal? I mean, we can do it. Is there a big deal? Can it change the future? Let's go back to the question from uh, the time machine, or not the time machine, the flight machine. Yes. Like, yes, it absolutely does. There's a theme here. Um, so can it change the future? Can we screw things up? Eccles glanced across the vast office at a mass and tangle, a snaking and humming of wires and steel boxes. At an aurora that flickered, now orange, now silver, now blue, there was a sound like a gigantic bonfire burning all of time, all the years and all the parchment calendars, all the hours, piled high and set aflame. What is this describing? What is a mass and tangle of snaking and humming of wires? What is that? 
It's the literal time. Oh, it's the literal time machine. It's sitting in the corner. It's a mass and tangle, a snaking and humming of wires. Um, so we've got um, personification, the humming wires. That's very small personification. Um, we've got now orange, now silver, now blue, which is repetition. Now, it's not all it's repeating is the phrasing, but why is it repeating? We discussed this earlier today. It could be because that's the sequence in which it flashes. It could be that it's supposed to be significant somehow. I don't know, but there's that repetition. It could just be to create an effect and a, and a rhythm, so to say. Uh, there was a sound like a gigantic bonfire burning all of time. What kind of figurative language is that? Hey. Um, what kind of figurative language is that? It's a simile, yeah. That's a great question. <laughs> she always asks, why is time cap capitalized? Well, it's like the safari guide is capitalized, the past is capitalized, time is capitalized. All these things are, I guess, names. Yeah, I know. Good question, though. Good thing. Good question. Um. And then the other little bit of repetition, it's just this phrasing, again, all the years, all the parchment, all the hours, I'm not gonna highlight that, but all of that is repeated as well. A touch of the hand and this burning would on the instant beautifully reverse itself. Eccles remembered the wording in the advertisements to the letter, out of, out of chars and ashes, out of dust and coals, like golden salamanders. The old years, the green years might leap, roses sweet in the air, white hair turn Irish black, wrinkles vanish. All, everything, fly back to seed, flee death, rush down to their beginnings. Suns rise in western skies and set in glorious easts. Moons eat themselves opposite to the custom. All and everything cupping one and another like Chinese boxes, rabbits into hats, all and everything returning to the fresh death, the seed death, the green death, to the time before the beginning. A touch of a hand might do it, the merest touch of a hand. What is he describing? Them going, back in time. them going back in time. It is like a film run backwards because he's describing out of chars and ashes and dust rise up these things out of nothing, out of them being destroyed. It says fly back to seed. So this whole time I'm picturing a tree that has the leaves off, the leaves fly up, they're red, then they're green, and then they fall off again. And every time this process happens, this tree is shrinking and it's happening quickly. You can have the coconut drawer, drawer if you want. The rest of it, I saved it for you. Um, and then eventually, every time it's a little smaller until it shrinks, it's a sapling, and then it like twists back down into the earth into a seed. Because everything is going backwards. Um, the white hair turns Irish black. The wrinkles smooth out and go away. Everything flies back to seed. It flees death. Um, the suns rise in western skies and set in glorious easts. That's the opposite. And this phrasing about the moon eating themselves. Because there's the phases of the moon, and so as it comes over, like it looks like it's being gulped. If it's happening quickly. Like if you're watching it in a fast forward kind of, or a rewind kind of thing. Okay. Okay. Um, now, something I noticed earlier today, and I had not noticed this particular thing before, is this. Yeah. It's repetition. Three times in one paragraph. What does that mean? Oh, I like that. I like that. Says it three times in one paragraph. Could it be foreshadowing? What does it mean? What's he trying to say with that? Amir's touch of the hand does what? Change the future. Yes. Now, all it takes is a touch of a hand to flip the switch for the time machine. That's all it takes. But that's also all it could take to change everything. And I'm glad a lot of times kids don't know about the butterfly effect, so I'm glad that you do. Um, I just started writing in blue, not purple. Ah! 
not. It's okay. Um, yeah. A little touch can change everything. Not just make them travel back in time, but it can potentially undo a lot of things. Could that be foreshadowing? Unbelievable, Eccles breathed, the light of the machine on his thin face. A real time machine. He shook his head. Makes you think, if the election had gone badly yesterday, I might be here now running away from the results. Thank God Keith won. He'll make a fine president of the United States. Oh, boy. Um, I teach this story every year. I did not pick this out because it is an election year. Just saying. I'm just saying. I did not plan this deliberately. Um, okay, so we've got Keith. What does Keith make you think of? <laughs> um, okay, so this guy is our winner. He won, and we are happy about that. All right. Um, if the election had gone badly, he says it might be running away. All right. Yes, said the man behind the desk. We're lucky. If Deutscher had gotten in, we'd have the worst kind of dictatorship. That's an anti-everything man for you. A militarist, anti-Christ, anti-human, anti-intellectual. People called us up, you know, joking, but not joking, said if Deutscher became president, they wanted to go live in 1492. Of course, it's not our business to conduct escapes, but to form safaris. Anyway, Keith's president now. All you got to worry about is shooting my dinosaur. Eccles finished it for him. Let's talk about this. Well, that's another great question. Escapes, safaris. They're names of things, I'm guessing. Like showing the significance of, of it, I guess. I mean, I think it's trying to make it a thing. Just like the safari is a thing, an escape would be a thing. Because I bet there are companies that time travel that do that. They take them and leave people. You know they do. You know there have to be unethical people. There's everybody breaks the law. Like someone, there's always someone running a dirty business. So I bet that's a thing. Okay, so Deutscher, who is that? The other guy. What do you think of his name? It, weird. it, it does sound German because uh, Deutscher, Deutsch, Deutschland means Germany. The Deutschland Sender was a German radio show. The Deutschmark was currency. So when did I say the story was written? 1952. So seven years after the end of the war. I think Ray Bradbury was trying to make a point. Anti-everything man. He was a militarist, so he liked that, but he was anti-Christ. I don't think that means he was the anti-Christ. I think it means he's anti-religion, anti-Christianity specifically. Um, Hitler did not like the Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, not only were the Jews like discriminated against, but so were the Jehovah's Witnesses. They were rounded up and put into camps. They were marked with purple badges, purple triangles. Uh, if you wanted to be released from a camp, um, history tells us that you could have signed a, a document, signed a waiver, basically, and said, I, like, pledge my allegiance to Adolf Hitler, I forswear my God, and you could be released from the camps. But they don't have any documentation of anyone ever doing that. They have people who, after the war, said that that was offered to them, but they were faithful, and they believed that God would deliver them from the situation, and for some of them he did, and some of them that did not. Um, so anti-Christ, anti-human. I don't think that means robot. What might that mean? Huh? Human rights. Yeah, definitely. Um, we're not going to send humanitarian aid to other countries. We're not going to, you know, send food and supplies. We're not going to bring in refugees from Syria and places like that. We're going to close the borders. Like we're going to close things down. Um, Anti-intellectual. Maybe no schools, maybe only education for certain people. Um, Hitler 
did not want, I mean, the Jews to be educated. He did not want the Poles to be educated. He was going to close their schools to them after third grade because the purpose for them was to be the slaves of the German people. There is a reason that it was illegal to teach slaves to read. There's a reason that women weren't allowed into colleges in certain times in history and we were encouraged to stay home. And then we weren't given the vote until a certain year. Like there's reasons for these things. So they are very happy because they got the president that they wanted. But then I'm looking at this. Oh, no. No. Like no one's going to die the there and then he's going to. No. I'm not going to tell you what happens. I don't know what happens. <laughs> But I'm telling you, it's a very simple, simple thing. So we all must be careful. Touch of a hand, touch of a hand. Okay, so we'll finish this, maybe finish it tomorrow or the next day, probably the next day, because I don't think I can read all of that seven times tomorrow. I don't think I can do that. I don't think I will want to. I've read it all in a day before. I did. Turn it off now.